I, I'll tell you what, and I mean this, and I'm just weird, but I'm excited. Amen. Because whatever happens, God allowed it to happen. Amen. And the thing is, we just have got to realize, and not just realize here, but realize here. Guys, there is a difference, okay? There's, there's a difference when you say, I know the Bible says, yes, you can believe it here just as well as here. And no matter what happens, I know that God's not only in control, but God has a plan. Amen. And let me tell you something, why you've got to be excited. <laughs> You're part of that plan. Amen. Amen. God wanted, chose, planned for you to be born in this day and time. With everything going around us and the mess and everything, God said, I want Tony and Jenny and Jordan and Logan to be born right smack there. And I know what's going on and I know what's going to happen before and I know what's going to happen after. But I don't make mistakes and I wanted them born then because I have a plan. So this is what we do. How is God going to use the Tasmanian devil sitting on the couch? You know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, God's like, what are you doing? Then we go to church. I trust you, God. Come on. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I get just as worked up as everybody else. You want to know what I want? I'll, no, I can't tell you. But uh, <laughs> no, I will tell you. I, I, I promise you, I, I've gotten over that. Um, I, I know that I can't endorse a, a, a candidate, but I can sure endorse truth. You guys know that that's okay to do? Amen. And if you're offended by it, you're offended by God. I want you guys to turn in your Bibles, because that's what we come here to do, to Daniel chapter 1. And I'm going to give you a long introduction. And Richard and I got together and I, I said, I need you to make me something. And I, I want to walk them through that. If God made everything and God is in control... Let me give you a verse that God has said. He said, I am the Alpha. And he said, I am the first. You know what God was going? God was going back to the beginning of time. And God was going to establish it at the very beginning from Genesis chapter 1, the very verse 1. He said, I am the first. I am the Alpha. I am the A. I am the beginning. And just so you guys know where I'm going with this. And God comes down here and he says, let me just lay it out for you. I'm the end as well. I'm the alpha and the omega. I'm the beginning and the end. So as much as God knew what he was doing when God created DNA, and as much as God knew what he was doing when he created us and and, and humans and the the atmosphere and the seasons and the stars and the galaxies and all of that, God said, every bit of it I know I have planned. It works. I said, wait a minute. Same is still true in the end. And we can sit there and say, wow, look at God's creation. Look at how he's all-knowing. And look at how he's all-powerful. That does not change through the course of time. God had a timeline. And at the beginning of the timeline, he also had an end of that timeline. He created everything. And without him, not anything made that was made. He spoke it into existence. Six days. One day of rest. Then God started his plan 4,000 years, 4,000 years. And along that line, he dropped in Abraham because he knew where and what he wanted Abraham to do. And he dropped in Isaac when he wanted them. And Gideon and Esther and Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and all of the prophets and every bit of it. It was God, it was God, it was God, it was God, it was God. And they prophesied of that, leading up to that. Every king, every prophet... Every man, every woman, every one of them. When I speak of the sovereignty of God, don't get all weirded out about that. That just simply means everything that we're putting in one word, that God is in control. God is ultimately over all things. When your mind cannot add it up, when it is beyond what you think, when we sit there and say, this isn't going the way that I would like, it is going the way that he allows. He came transition because all that time they were prophesying to the cross and then Jesus came 
He was born in a way that they weren't expecting. He came in a way that they did not expect. He came as a humble servant. He came as a baby. He came as a servant. He took on flesh. He was in the likeness of men. He, he ministered for 33 years and then he went to the cross. Three days later, he came out of the grave. Forty days later, he ascended up into heaven. He, re, he, he promised through all of this and he began something. He said, now from here on, This is what I'm going to have you do. I'm going to empower you greater than any power they've ever had because you're going to have the indwelling of God, not visitation with God through the Holy of Holies, but the indwelling of God through the Holy Spirit. You know what God did? God raised the bar with a generation. We sit there and say, man, I wish I could be like Abraham. Abraham would look forward and say, they've got the indwelling of God. You mean they've got the Holy Spirit? And I'm over here killing animals and you've got the Holy Spirit with you everywhere you go. I don't don't think you guys realize how blessed of a a generation we are. Because God was looking down and he was saying through that generation that I've got a job and a plan. And I'm going to give you an anointing and a presence and a power to go with it. He empowered them with everything that they needed because the church was no longer counting up to the cross. The church is counting down to the end. And I know for some people are like, well, that's that's good. That's good. It's good. But let me tell you, as as we get into this, this sounds like all hocus pocus and weird and, you know, science fiction and stuff like that. Because, man, this stuff is just like, what? You know, it's like walking around with a billboard. The end is near, you know, and all these. Let me tell you guys, regardless of how Hollywood makes fun of this, the end is near. And that's not doom and gloom of, oh man, it's, praise God. It's the end of cancer. It's the end of sin. It's the end of despair. It's the end of ISIS. It's the end of abortion. It's the end of murder. It's the end. It is victory. Victory. And so, God made these promises. In John 14, 3, when he was laying out the end and laying out the commission, he said, and I go to prepare a place for you. And I will come again. I will come again. You realize, God, that was a promise that he said, you know, he's doing that. If we had the physical timeline, I know you're looking up there. God comes up and he goes, he draws a line and he goes, I know when that is. Amen. God's saying, I will come again. And we're sitting there going, when, Lord, when, when? And he said, it's not for you. You trust me. You follow me. I am in control. But I know, I know there's that line. And so for all of us, as we get to the end of that line, we don't know what it is. Let me put it like this, okay? Uh, you guys understand football. Last night, the Buckeyes barely squeezed out one in. It was, it was a nail-biter. I was like, oh, I can't go to bed. I don't know if they're going to win. <laughs> if you didn't watch the game, it was, it was 62 to 3. <laughs> There's four quarters in a game. And I believe the New Testament... Where we're at, the Bible and the church age and the age of grace is like the fourth quarter. You go back through there. But I think, and I'm just telling you, I think we're hearing the two-minute warning. Amen. Amen. Right, right, right. Amen. Yes. And, and I, I know when we read verses like Matthew 24, 33, So likewise, when you shall see these things, know that it is near. You say, what are these things? I I don't have time to go into these things. I am doing this in a two-part message. I I, I ask you to come back tonight. You'll get the second half of this. We'll have communion and prayer tonight. And the second half of this. I I, I know when he said that, four verses later, he says these things. And he goes, but as in the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son man be. Sin had overcome the world, and it was wicked, 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 wicked continually. You know what I'm saying? It's just got a time where the same thing with the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Can you find me ten? Like Brother Wally was saying, find me ten. Find me ten. I'll spare it. I can't find ten. And so, so the, the, the influence of Christianity kept getting smaller. And all of a sudden, people were more ch- chanting for, for death of babies and for rights and all these things that go against these things than they were for that. These things is what God was talking about, was a turn, was a defilement, was uh, uh, abominations against God. And I tell you, when there was always somebody speaking up for it, but now the voice of America is, is yelling more for this. 
than we are. We need you, Lord. These are the things. There's a place and a time now where they call good evil and evil good. Same way that God placed Abraham on this planet for such a time there. With all of my heart, I'm not trying to be cocky, I'm just going to tell you the truth. I, Tony Liuzzo, have been placed by God right here for such a time as this. Amen. This isn't a doom and gloom of, he's saying God's coming back tomorrow. I don't know. I don't know, but I, I do know when he says, when you see these things come to pass, know that the time is near. What is near? I don't know. You know, you know what I'm saying? I, I don't know, but I, I'm going to tell you, we need, there's a way to act and there's a way to live for us to understand this. I am as much and you are as much of the timeline of Jesus Christ and his plan as Abraham and Isaac was. And the way that God waited so many years to give him Isaac and the way that Gideon was raised up at a certain time and the way that God orchestrated Esther to be in the, in the place of Mordecai and Haman and all those other things at that specific time, I know without a doubt that Fellowship Baptist Church, you and I are here right now for such a time as this. And I've got to believe it with my heart. I cannot get there and be like, oh, God's saying, what are you, stop. You're my child. I told you this. Act like my child. Daniel chapter one. Daniel chapter one. Josiah was the king. And I'm going to go back to him in a minute. He was a good king. Loved God. Tore down the wicked idols. Actually, you read the story. This king, when he got into it, he, he, the Bible says he smashed him into pieces. I mean, he was just like, you can imagine the passion that he had to tear down the idols that invaded and took over from the wicked kings of the past. But after he passed, his wicked sons take over. They did not follow God. They did not honor God. Babylon walks into their nation and takes the best of the best of their people to use for their good, to exalt their gods and to do their will. Among them was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, you know what everybody gravitates when they tell these stories? They go right to the fiery furnace and they go right to the lion's den. Well, let me tell you, the chapters that we're hitting have nothing to do or they they have the leading up to the lion's den in there. You've got to go back and realize what God was doing at the beginning of this. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, listen to the next verse. You've got to understand. And I'm going to give you the foundation of this so you understand this passage. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim into, of King Judah into his hand. And you're like, what? So let me put it like this. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, and all the other ones that were brought there to be eunuchs or servants are brought there, placed there by God. And Daniel said, I know I'm here because God allowed it. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, his children of whom there was no blemish, blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding, science and such had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. All of a sudden, their world changed. All of a sudden, everything that these four men and all the other ones knew changed right then. And let me tell you guys, we could identify with this and say that we live in a changing world. But I'm, I want to do something with you that's something that maybe we'd normally do in a Sunday school lesson or whatever. I want to bring you back and I want to plug you into the history leading up to this. And I promise you, you're going to look at Daniel chapter 1, 2, 3 through everything that happens differently when you see the history. So I'm going to ask you right now to turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 1. 2 Kings 23, verse 1. You need to understand why. Why is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel in this place? Why are they under the oppression of the enemy? Why are they in a place where they're worshiping idols? Why are they in a place that their God is not exalted whatsoever? We start with Josiah, the former leadership. 
2 Kings 23, 1, And the king sent and gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went unto the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by a pillar and he made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes and their heart and all their soul, to perform the words of this covenant which were written in this book and all the people stood to the covenant. So he takes it back and says, man, let me tell you about a time. Man, there was a king of passion. If you guys don't remember the story, when this guy started out, he was eight years old. Eight years old. Jump forward to 2 Kings 23, verse 25. Let me, let me show you. The, the, the thrust of this message is not the history, but verse 25. And like unto him, there was no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul, and with all his might. According to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose any like him. Josiah dies and the nation begins to fall far from God. Verse 36, Jehoiakim was 20 and 5 years old when he began the reign. The same king that we read, the same ruler that we read at Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem and his mother's name was Zebudah and the daughter of Padiah of Rumah. And he said that which was, e- and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. Let me tell you, it is righteousness that exalts a nation. It is God that protects a nation. It is God that blesses a nation. When you kick God out, you are on your own. Judgment will follow, and sin will affect. Sin will take its toll. Great nations, greater than the United States of America, have fallen in our past because they have refused to follow God. So chapter 24, verse 1. In those days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant three years, and he turned and rebelled against him. That's Daniel 1, 1, verse 2. And the Lord sent against him bands of Chaldeans, and the bands of Syrians, and the bands of the Moabites, and the bands of the children of Ammon, And he sent them against uh, Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord. And he spake his servants of prophecy. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he did. What did he do? And also for the innocent blood that he shed. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood which the Lord would not pardon. I ask you again, why did God allow Nebuchadnezzar to walk into their nation and take them captive? It's simply this, you reap what you sow. That's not a principle that Baptists or whatever, that is a principle that God said, you reap what you sow. Do you guys know it's an estimated 58 million abortions in America since Roe versus Wade was established in 1973? 58 million I don't know how that compares to what was done by Manasseh in that day and age and by Jehoiakim and those that turned their back on God. But I guarantee you, if we were to measure the blood of those innocent babies, it would sicken us to know what we have done. That is a lot of innocent blood. They were wicked. They were not following God. And God was in control of all that was happening. It was part of God's plan. And can I point out to these followers of God What things had changed? What things had changed? Let let me tell you, as you go through there, all of a sudden in their nation, it's no longer Judah, it's no longer their home. These men would be telling you that their world had changed. The consequences of their nation's sin changed their world. Sin has an effect on the world, and it started in the Garden of Eden. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death, and that's part of the timeline. Guys, let me just tell you, our United States, our world, we always talk about the third you know, uh, phase of cancer, or the fourth stage of cancer. Let me tell you, America is in the fourth stages of sin. You cannot expect us to do this and not reap what we have sown. And turn our heads of the innocent. Their leadership have changed. 
They're no longer answering to the leaders that they had, but answering to pagan worshipers. Place them in bondage. Their view of God was changed. Not I'm talking about them, but the world that they lived in. Things went from bad to worse. They went from a nation that had forgotten God to a, worship, to a nation that now is worshiping false gods. To the degree, you can imagine, as they, they walk into their, 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 their temples and they grab the things of their God, the, the things, and they go in and they establish those in the, the, the worship of their, their pagan gods. Now guys, just to put it in regards, you say, man, I get so worked up and I get so bothered. What if you were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel, and you're walking in there, you see the things of your God that they once worshipped, and all of a sudden those things are now being held up and used to burn sacrifice and stuff to a pagan God. Would that bother you? It'd be like if 10 years down the road, if Fellowship Baptist Church had to sell our, our building, and all of a sudden you walked in here and we saw a Muslim mosque and people in here worshiping and burning incense and worshiping, calling out to another God. It's the same thing. I, I'm getting a point. I'm, I want you to see that everything around them has changed. Their lives have changed to the point where it was not their home. Even their names had changed. And everything they were doing, they were trying to adapt these four men and all the other men to adapt to be like them. Can I tell you, church, I love America and I love our nation, but we are not home. And maybe for some of you, that's going to take time to get in there. But I want you to understand that Jesus died on a cross to give us a home. And I love this land, but this land is not our home. And I think sometimes we get so worked up because what our plans are and what our feeling is and everything is the fact that our plans and our land is changing. And God says, no, I died to save you, to bring you to the real one. They're walking through Babylon and these men were sure to say that this is not home as they saw this. When we go from being one nation under God to lighting up the White House in the rainbow colors, I can tell you we are not home. For the first time in history... We have a candidate running for president that's the first one ever to be endorsed by Planned Parenting with making a vow that she will raise the bar and change the boundaries on abortion. Although the world has not changed for these four men, the world around them was changing drastically. Can I point out in this, and this is, this is the thrust, and, and we'll continue this tomorrow night. There was everything that did change, but can I point out what did not change? See, we read in here that our confidence in God cannot change, church. I read in Daniel chapter 1, verse 2, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. You know what that was written by? It was written by Daniel. And some people speculate that, but that was written by Daniel. For him to step back and say, hey, listen, God is in control. But I want to tell you guys, if we dare say that God is in control and it does not reflect through our actions and our attitudes, then how is the world going to know that God is in control? Saying it on Sunday does not enforce what we live on Monday. Amen. On. It's easier said than done. When we're acting like things are falling, constantly falling apart, how does this reflect that our God is in control? Should sin bother us? Yes. You think about these guys. Here they are being a living testimony, living unto God in the place that they were. But when they said bow down, they would not bow. When they said, you cannot pray, Daniel said, I will pray three times a day and you can throw me in whatever you want to throw me in, but I will not change because I believe in my God. You guys have to understand, there's got to be some conviction in our hearts. Not only were they they showing in this that God was in control, but they were showing their convictions for their God. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He had a choice to make. He realized that we don't make that choice, but Daniel said, you know what? There's, there's your false God and there's the real God. And Daniel drew a line and said, I will stand over here with the one and true God. Guys, every one of us right now of what Daniel was doing, he said, I refuse to be associated with the false gods. I, re- I refuse to eat the false meat or the meats that were all there. Offer the false gods. I'm going to tell you, you're not going to like this. And I tell you, this doesn't help boost attendance on Sunday. But there's a decision to be made for every one of us. Which side you're going to stand on. Either for righteousness or that which goes with the world. 
we're going to decide whether we're going to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know why a lot of us don't? Because a lot of us are facing the fiery furnace, or a lot of us are facing opposition, or being thrown to the lion's den. Rather than saying that our God's in control and my God will stand with me, we wave to the other side because we'd rather please man than God. May God have mercy on our souls if we think that this is all about us. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not stand where they were for the sake of themselves, but they stood because they had conviction in their heart for something greater than themselves. And in the midst of them doing that, they stood out. In the midst of doing that, they realized that there was a hurting nation that needed the truth. You guys realize that their conviction and their stand for God led to incredible influence for God. See, these men got it. The world was in a mess. The nation was evil. The leaders were pagan. Sin was raised all around them. It was very different. We talk about moving to Canada. Let me tell you, you can't move to Canada because God's placed us here. The needs are greater now than ever before. Through their confidence in their God and their conviction, God raised them up to a level of influence. In Daniel chapter 1 verse 9, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. With respect, with something that they said there's something different about these guys. Guys, they're, they're, this is the time where people see that we stand up for something to where they can turn back and say, hey, this is not working. But man, they've been standing up for something along the way that is working. Daniel 1.17 For as these four, God gave them knowledge and skill and learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all vision and dreams. Do you guys see what's going on here? God reached out and he said, man, I'm going to bless these guys because I'm going to use these guys. God does not raise up an army and have them sit on the sidelines. Do you guys get that? What kind of military would we have if all you did was walk into every military base and they were sitting there potlucks and playing, playing cards and you'd be like, what, what's that? No, you were trained. You went to boot camp. You were given these blessings. You have the weapons. You were instilled with all these things to do something with it. So here we are, church. We've been blessed in America. I went off to Bible college. I was raised in a Christian home. I've, I've been given a family that's able to go into a credible church. My kids are being raised in a wanted. They know the word of God. I've been blessed with a godly Christian wife. I have the word of God. I've studied the word of God. I've been in church since the day that I was born. And I'm here to tell you that most of you or a lot of you have the same testimony and the same story. You know why? Because God has equipped us for something. Have you ever thought about that? That God has equipped us for something. It could it simply be that in the timeline of God, when God comes down and he says, hey, when the time is near, when things are changing, when the world is in distress, when everything's falling apart, I need there to be a generation that's ready to do the job. Amen. And that's us. He said, you don't know that for sure, but I do know this. That the world is in desperate need of somebody that's going to stand up. You you turn the chapter and you're going to find Nebuchadnezzar could not sleep. He said, man, something's wrong. And all the planning and all the people and all the wisdom and everything that I have, something is desperately wrong. And they ushered in Daniel. And Daniel stood before him and he said, you got to give me the interpretation of this dream. He said, I am tore. I am miserable He said, I will have the heads of anybody that's not able to interpret this dream. I am miserable with where I'm at. You know what Daniel was raised there? Because Daniel had the answer to what he needed. Do you guys realize that right now in the world that's going through all this tragic stuff, that we have the answer to what the world needs? And I know this right here is like, oh, man, I don't want to face that. But I do know that God has a plan. And I do know that God will put the right people in the right place at the right time for his plan. The same way that he did it with Daniel, the same way that he did it with Adam and Eve from the very beginning, and God goes and he said, hey, I am the Alpha, but I'm also the Omega. And God comes to the end of it and he said, I'll tell you what, I need my people to do their job in the right time in the right way when it's there. On November 9th, we will either wake up with the attitude that we have a job to do. He said, no, 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 it's November 8th. No, I'm talking about November 9th. Regardless of what happens on November 8th, November 9th, we wake up with a job to do. Regardless of who's in power. It doesn't matter who's in power. It's a matter about the God that we serve. Either way, the world needs us. 
Either way, God is in control. Either way, we're nearing the end. Either way, we've got to stand in our convictions. We're not alone in this. And I'm going to be transparent. Does everything that's going around bother me? Absolutely. Do you know why it bothers me so bad? Because I want more than anything for my children to be able to enjoy all the blessings that I was raised with. Amen, that's right. I, I, I want them to be able to go to church and I want them to experience God and I want them to see revivals and I want them to go to camp and hear preachers and I want them to surrender the preach or whatever God has for them. I want all that for them. I do. So if anybody's going to sit there and say, oh, you're just throwing in the towel of that. But I also know that God, I have to be ready for whatever God has next. Because I know that if God said that this must come to pass, and let me tell you, church, then this must come to pass. We need to start living as if we believe that it must come to pass.